everyone. Welcome to Home Cooking with Foodland. It's great to see everyone. A um, couple of things that I, we hope you all enjoyed. For those of you there on the island that you enjoyed and stopped by our Kahala Market uh, by Foodland. I saw some of you helped you get some uh, some of the hala. And we were looking, some of you were asking me about where to find the, uh, the leaving powder. So it was nice to see you. And we hope that everyone's really you know enjoying the store. A um, couple of things I wanted to do a shout out to Laura who did Brussels sprouts, sent us a picture, really awesome. And Phyllis, really, really cool email. email. Um, you know, you sent us a picture of your Thanksgiving dinner and a picture of the tech stream of how people really love the dinner. And um, it's just really nice to know that people are doing the things that we're talking about and you guys are having a great result. And so I think that's what makes it worth it. Um, and without further ado, let's get into today's class. Uh, as I think about, you know, again, we're in the holiday season and while um, you may be having a modified to get together, I still thought it'd be fun to do things that um, are sort of holiday-ish or for holiday get togethers. And of course, at some point we're gonna get past this, right? Um, and then these will be all things that you have in your repertoire that you can do when, they're, when you have larger get togethers. So um, today we're gonna do crispy gauji and we're gonna do walk chart edamame. And if there's time, I might throw something else in I always want to, I, send, I try to have something in my back pocket in case we have time, but um, uh, let's go ahead and jump into this. So, oh, by the way, again, if you have questions, please use the question and answer function on the Zoom app and Cheryl will be shouting questions out at me um, and we'll get started. So, uh, crispy gauji, super popular dish in Hawaii. It's Chinese. I don't know if it's like, I think it's what it's Chinese. I think it's Cantonese in origin and I'm probably in China, it's completely different. But what we have here um, is, is basically, a, and I made a few, so you can show, I can show you what they look like pre-cooked, pre but it, it's a wonton pea, which is a wrapper filled with a pork stuffing, and then we're gonna deep fry them. And when we have get togethers, usually someone's gonna bring a bunch of them and we eat, them, eat these as poo-poos. And before dinner is served, usually you've eaten like six or seven of them, of them and you're just, you know, you're gorging out of them because you can't get enough. Um, the filling that I'm going to show you how to make is actually a great um, all-around filling. You can you can use this to make sort of like pork meatballs. If you're oh, by the way, for those of you that had your turkey and you had leftovers, you made chook. This filling that I'm going to show you is perfect to put into the chook to make little pork hash meatballs. You can take the stuffing, you can steam it, uh, and make pork hash. Um, you can use it. Uh, what else can you do with this thing? You can stuff eggplant with it. So really versatile, okay? Um, I'm starting with shrimp. We have, uh, I have four quarter pound here of shrimp. I peeled them and we're just gonna go ahead and chop them. Now, I am using 2125s, which are a little bit larger shrimp. Um, and I like them because they're nice and meaty, but if you want to, you can buy smaller shrimp because we are chopping this up. The smaller shrimp are gonna be a little bit less expensive. But the, the, the trade-off is you're gonna have a lot more shrimp to peel. So you gotta think about what makes more sense for you and what the trade-off is. Okay, so we got this all chopped up. And this is gonna actually do two things. It's gonna create flavor, right? It's gonna add flavor to the, uh, the filling, but also all of this uh, protein here that's chopped up is gonna help add, act as a binder too. So the shrimp's gonna go in. Let me go wipe my knife here real quick. And then we're going to add our pork. I have one pound of ground pork here. Put that in real quick. We have some water chestnuts. These are sliced water chestnuts. We'll chop these up. To be all rough chop, yeah. So first I'll just kind of quickly run through them. And one thing I do have is I have vegetable oil behind me and I'm preheating it. So I may need to check it because I don't want it to get too hot. I'm looking for somewhere between 325 and 350 degrees Fahrenheit. Now these water chestnuts are great. Um, 
They're very mild. They don't have a whole lot of flavor, but they add a lot of great texture, a really nice crunchy texture. For those of you not familiar with water chestnuts, they're very similar to jicama. Do a real quick chop here. And then, and again, I got my Chinese cleaver, which is a great bench scraper. Put that in. Let me just check the, the oil here real quick. Um, and again, I, I, when you're doing this, a lot of people will, will fry by feel. Um, and that works if you're really good at this, but I'm gonna use a thermometer because it, you know, the things that we talk about is the, the more precise your measurements are, the better cooking you're gonna have, right? So this is eyeballing at some, at some degree works, but um, sometimes it's really better to, to check. And so like I'm at 335, 336, it's coming up nicely. And I have it, I've been heating this up for about half an hour on very low so that it can gradually come up temperature. Um, and so we're, we'll be in good shape when it's when we're ready. Garlic cloves, I already cut the stems off. Uh, County, can you use jicama as a substitute? You know, I've never tried, but I think you can. You just got to be careful. The jicama is um, is a little bit wa more watery than water chestnuts, but I think you can, it's worth, I would experiment. If I had jicama and that's all I had, I would try it. And, and if you have jicama in your home, that's pretty cool. And you mentioned you're using vegetable oil, but is yeah. there a vegetable oil to avoid because of a low smoke point? Um, I would say most of the vegetable oils that are available uh, in the shelf for, you know, like whether it's canola or corn oil or vegetable, which is a blend, those are all fine. Um, peanut oil works great. That has a very high smoke point. Um, and when you're going to be doing a lot of frying or you need a lot of oil, you know, the cost becomes a consideration, right? So like avocado oil would work great as a great smoke point, but it would be very expensive. So um, I would say any of those oils, if you wanted to, you could use vegetable shortening that would work too. Uh, but those are all key. Those are, those, are, those are all good oils that you can use. Safflower oil works great too. I think the key oils you're going to see that are widely available though would be um, the canola, corn, or a vegetable, which is a blend or peanut oil. Someone is asking what is jicama and where do you find that? So jicama is a, it's technically classified as a tuber. So uh, just like a potato is a tuber, right? It's not an actual root. It's a storage, it's a store of energy for the plant. Um, so the plant grows and it's, it grows in the ground. It's round and it's bulbous like that. Um, and it's used in a lot of uh, Hispanic cuisine. I think I think the South uses it a little bit, but um, but primarily it's used. It's a very watery. I think um, Hispanic. I think they use it in some like uh, a lot of Hispanic cuisines, like Port, uh, South America, but also used in like in uh, Puerto Rico, et cetera. And they'll make salsas and things like that. They'll use it as a a garnish. So they'll peel it. They'll dice them into uh, strips and put like lime juice and cayenne on them and eat them, it's crunchy. So um, it's, a, it's a very refreshing kind of a vegetable. Questions about oil. What about yes. coconut oil or rice bran oil? Rice bran oil would work. Coconut oil, in my opinion, would not work just because the coconut oil imparts coconut flavor. I've never tried a coconut oil that does not taste like coconut. So. I mean, if you really want to have coconut flavor and that's what you really want to use a coconut oil, I think you can get away with it. I think you just got to decide like if you're really willing to spend the money because once you fry this, the likelihood is the oil you're going to use is going to get discarded. So, you know, three or four, maybe three to five dollars is you're going to get one of these containers of oil here that I'm using. I used to have Crisco Pure Canola. One of these, I think it's 32 ounces, 48 ounces. What is this? Uh, what, 48 ounce, this is like about three to five dollars. I mean, if you're going to use coconut oil to get this much, it's probably going to add up pretty quickly. So I think that's a decision that you would have to make a personal decision, but I, it would work. Olive oil? Olive oil, I would say 
technically, if you were going to use just olive oil, not um, extra virgin olive oil would work. But then now you're starting to deal with um, flavor again. You're still going to have a little bit of olive flavor in it. And again, the cost of that much olive oil to fry, I think, is, is, is to me, not worth it. Um, and then I'm thinking of the style of cuisine, right? This is an Asian dish. I, I don't feel like olive oil is a good pairing for that. So we have, uh, I just put in green onions, show you. I'm gonna put some, uh, this is the oyster sauce. We'll put a little bit inside there. And then we're gonna go ahead and mix this all together. You may see recipes that have egg in there. And sometimes if I'm just gonna make pork hash, I will put egg in it. But in this particular recipe, I'm not putting egg because I want this to be firmer. If I put the egg in here, it's gonna be a little more loose. Um, even though egg is a binder, I don't think that when I added a shrimp, that's enough of a binder. Plus the, just the ground pork itself is a good binder. And I think that's enough. But again, when I'm mixing this, right? You can use it if you're, you, your hand if you want, but um, as you can see, I'm, I'm kind of pushing it down I'm, to incorporate it. I'm spinning the bowl so that I can gradually incorporate this all together. And I keep cleaning the bowl to bring it all together and keep it working neat. Now, when it's starting to come together like this, then I will start to flip it over. Can you use Worcestershire sauce if you don't have that other sauce? Uh, which one, uh, instead of the oyster sauce? Uh, I wouldn't use Worcestershire sauce because the Worcestershire sauce has a, has a different flavor profile. It has spices in there. Um, and those spices I think would compete. Now, one thing that you could use is co coconut aminos, which I think people use as a shoyu substitute. If you have tamari, that would work. Let me check the temperature again. Um, if you don't have oyster sauce, then I, you, can, you're, you can just add a little bit extra, um, a little bit more shoyu, but just don't add too much because at some point the shoyu just makes it taste salty. Uh, if you don't have oyster sauce, you can also add a little bit of fish sauce because you want that flavor that it provides. You can add extra shrimp. You could smash up some anchovies if you have and throw them. You're trying to get this fishy, shrimpy flavor in there. If you have dried shrimp, you can put them in there. Another thing that works is, um, okay, so like I'm at 369. Okay, so I'm gonna turn it down just a little bit. The other thing you can add in there is dried shiitake mushrooms or fresh shiitake mushrooms. So any of these kind of umami driven things uh, you can add to offset the oyster sauce. That said, if you don't have oyster sauce, you should buy some because once you start using it, you're gonna use it on everything if you do your Asian cooking. And, but, but I think in Hawaii too, sometimes we do too much of it. I think like I've seen people do fried rice and they put too much oyster sauce and it's drowning in the oyster sauce. But oyster sauce gives it a really good um, umami and a nice richness and it's a little bit sweet. So all those things work. Um, and to that point, if you don't have the oyster sauce, if you add all that stuff that I said, that's gonna replace that fishy umami flavor you can also add a pinch of sugar in. And a lot of times people will make something like this and still add a pinch of sugar, even though they're using uh, the oyster sauce. So those are some different things that you can do to, to replace if you have to, okay? Okay, so we have our mix that looks good. These are one ton wrappers that I have that are, are widely available in supermarkets and Asian markets, but they're one ton wrappers or dim sum wrappers or one ton peas, what they're called. And they're usually, they're in a square. And I'm gonna show you guys how to make some and then we'll go ahead and fry some. So when you're setting this up, you have your filling. I have a scooper. This is like a one ounce scooper. You, you people use this for like sour cream and stuff. They're really good to use. You don't have one, that's fine. Use a spoon, that works just as good. Um, I usually have a little bit of water. I have a pastry brush here. If you don't have a pastry brush, that's fine. You can use your fingers. Um, but it just, to me, it keeps the process neat. Then I have a clean cutting board and I have a wet side towel because you're going to use this to constantly clean your hands while you're doing this. And then I have a sheet pan here and I have some cornstarch on here. Got some of my Argo cornstarch here. I just layered some on the bottom. And as I'm making them, I put them on the cornstarch to keep them from sticking together. And then I'm, I'm going to do more. I just keep building it and putting layers of parchment in between or wax paper. And these, just like this, you can make these and freeze them. 
and then fry them as you want. Okay, so that's one of the cool things about this is after class, you can make, you know, go make a hundred and then freeze all of them. And then when you have your get together of five people this holiday season, just do like 15 of them and then save them for later. Okay. And you didn't put ginger in the mix. I did, I did not. not. That's a good point. You can put ginger. That's another thing you can put. Ginger works great in there. If you want, you can put cilantro in there too. I mean, so this is a base recipe and you can take this and then you can start to layer in or add more flavor if you want. You know, some people can put some, some Chinese whiskey in here. Little, you know, there's little things you can do to just even get more bursts and build flavor. But you got to remember, like, if I go to the, my neighborhood Chinese restaurant, the probability is they're not going to put all that fancy stuff in there, right? Because, you know, when you make egg drop soup, it's one egg for 100 people. Okay, okay. so I have my uh, wonton wrapper here. And then I have sort of put a really fine, a very fine wa uh, brushing of water. I don't want too much because if I put too much, it won't stick. Then I take one of these, I put it right in the center, clean my fingers, just kind of like make it in a light, light oval shape. And then I take this and I fold it over. And for, I don't just, I don't know, it's a technique thing or what, but I like to fold it back over this way. And then I press it down and then I press it down again. So if it doesn't stick, that means there's too much water. Well, if it doesn't stick, yeah, that means that probably what happens is the water, it'll, it'll be slippery, it'll be sliding, it'll be, it will be like two pieces of wet noodles sliding back and forth. But see how they stick together nicely like that. And if it's, and so then I'll just take it here and I'll put a little bit of cornstarch here and I'll put it on here. Can you use flour instead of cornstarch? Yeah, I would do not want, you don't want to use flour. And the reason why is flour, uh, it reacts differently. Like a little, this will absorb, absorb moisture and not get clumpy. If you're using flour, you're going to end up with like paste. So don't use flour. You can use a pure starch though. Cornstarch works, mochiko flour would work, potato starch would work, but not flour, okay? So again, a quick light brush. We'll take one of these, a scoop, center. And can you just use your fingers if you don't have the brush? Yep, absolutely. I'm just trying to like show you, um, I want to I wanna try to show as many tools as I can when I do this thing with you guys. But, but here's the thing, you can use your fingers, but if, imagine this, right? Right now, I feel like the process that I'm showing you, when you look at my workstation and what I'm doing, right? It's neat. And when we're always cooking, and I think we talk about all the time, is we want to make sure that we're not making a huge mess. So imagine me using my hand to scoop this up, put it in here, then I got to wipe my hands, and I put my finger in here, and I wet hands, and I'll just get a big mess. And so like, I'm, I'm using this, I'm not touching this. I'm using this, I'm not getting my hands wet. And my, I have my towel here, and there's just a little bit of pork on there, but it's not crazy, right? So that's the reason why we kind of do it that way. So I, I just did two here for you. And I guess here, I'll show you just so you can see, you know, the, the thing that I think lear learning for me is really seeing too, right? I just, but if I were to put too much water and I put this over, see how it's doing that? It doesn't want to stick, right? Because I have the water now becomes a repellent from the other side and it's not sticking. Now, what you're seeing here too, by the way, this white stuff you're seeing here is flour. And so this, when this flour hits the really light layer of water, that's what's making the glue to stick it together, okay? Um, I wanted to show you one more thing that's kind of cool. Um, so you can make these and that's a gouji. Now you can also do this. Okay, you take the thing. And so you're starting to see this variations on a theme basically, right? So if I go in this way now, right? And then I go like this. It changes the flavor. Yeah. And I go like this. I have something else, right? And you can fry those, but those are like, you know, those are like when you go to restaurants and they have like fried wontons, right? Or when you're gonna make your, you know, you're gonna make one ton man or you wanna make one ton soup, that's how you get that. So again, triangle. 
Do you ever have a situation where the wrapper comes undone and then the pork comes out into the oil? Sometimes, but you know, when you're cooking a lot of these, you gotta expect that, you know, if you're really good, you're gonna get 100%, but usually, you know, you gotta get one that, we call them the jumper, you know what I mean? This one's like, I don't wanna do it, so. And then why is it that when you buy um, crispy gouji from the restaurant, it's really crispy and it stays crisp? Yeah, yeah that's, that's a good crispy. question. And I, even me, I've asked that question. I've tried to figure out, and I did crispy gouji on a video. And I think Cheryl was helping me in that video. And she, she's going to say, I was in that video. Uh, but the thing that I've always tried to figure is how to get it that way. And from what I have figured out is you really have to make sure the oil is not so hot because you're trying to, you want to really cook the wrapper so it's super crispy and all of the moisture is cooked out and it really cooked throughout on the inside. If your oil is too hot, 350 or higher, what happens quickly is like, oh my God, it's brown already. You take it out and the inside hasn't cooked all the way through and it's not really crispy. So you env envision going into the back of a Chinese restaurant, this guy probably has a huge wok with lots of oil and they put him in the, put in the oil and this little wonton or, or gouji is swimming around this huge swimming pool of oil and getting, getting really crispy. So when you're cooking them at home, you gotta make sure you're not overcrowding your pan. Let's go over here, we'll do some. You're not overcrowding your pan And you're getting you're not you're not too hot so that it doesn't brown too fast. So let's see. Yeah, because like when you a lot of times, right? I'm, like when you're talking about this, when you're making them at home, like everybody, you're, you're kind of like you're making them and people are like eating them fast because and then they sit out to a little while, then they're not as good as the Chinese restaurant ones. So I, I get what you're saying, and I, the, the, I don't make these at home very frequently, so I've I've not perfected that 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 getting the thing super crispy because I'd rather it's, it's easier for me to just pick up the phone, right? Um, but 350, right? We're gonna put these in. Now keep in mind, I'm putting this in now and it's gonna drop the temperature of the oil as this thing starts to fry. So we have to keep an eye on that. And I don't wanna over, as, because I'm doing it, I'm gonna turn the, the heat up so that I can account for the temperature dropping. But I'm not gonna overcrowd the pan too. Not gonna put more than four. Let's see what the temperature is. I wanna to try to keep it at 350, right? So let's see what I'm at. I'm a little high right now. So I can actually afford to put another one in. Someone wants to know if you can cook this in an air fryer. I've never tried that, but my assumption, my what I'm gonna say is no. And the reason why I I don't think you're gonna get the same crispness um, that you can get from using a deep fryer. This thing is holding temperature really well, so I'm gonna add more. We're gonna let this thing go. But you see, I, if you've done these at home before and you found that they're they don't they're not as crisp, think about what is the sound you hear when you're dropping them in. When you drop them in the fire, are you hearing a really loud sizzling or is it kind of quiet like this? And are the bubbles evenly coming up, but but at a or is it really really fast and rapid? Because if it's fast and rapid, what's probably happening is they're cooking too fast on the outside. And so you had to take them out because you don't want them to burn, but they didn't really have a chance to cook all the way through and get really, really crispy. So when you think about the ones you get at a Chinese restaurant, they look really golden brown all the way, right? And I'm also gonna push it down a little bit to try to submerge them, let them do their thing a little bit. And again, when you're doing this kind of frying, you know, when you're done frying, this, this oil is not really gonna be very good to use after because of all of the things that are going in there right now, you're gonna impurities fall out, you're gonna get um, cornstarch in there. And so it's not gonna be really good after this usage. So when you're gonna do this, when you're gonna fry, you really wanna fry, like come up with a bunch of things you wanna fry.
Like, if you're going to do this, maybe you should do this and do shrimp tempura and I don't know what else you can do if you want to do. Question. Yeah. Could you fry these in a larger pan, like a deep skillet? Not really deep frying, but not quite a shallow fry either. Also, there's more real estate in a larger circumference pan. Yeah, so you can, and this is the tricky part. These are the trade-offs, right? So for me, what I'm trying to do is replicate the deep frying that happens in a restaurant. And typically in a deep, in a restaurant, I'm gonna have uh, like five gallons of oil in a deep fryer. So if you think about how much fat is in that fryer and I have a basket that drops in and there's just such a large amount of oil that what it's doing is it's really maintaining the heat and submerging this really evenly and cooking it evenly. Can you do this in a, 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 a shallower, wider pan? Yes, you can. Can you, can you do that? But the difference is you're gonna to have to turn the thing over. You're gonna to have to turn them more and you're frying and the, the consistency is gonna look different. Um, to that point, yeah, I, I use a smaller pan because I want the depth and I didn't wanna use a whole gallon of oil to do this. And so that's the choice that I made um, in the trade-off because I'm only gonna do a small batch. But I think what you'll see, and I think the question you have to ask is, you know, the person that was asking about the crispy, Gaoji thin crispy, how are you cooking it? Because if you're cooking it like in a thin, in a, in a thin layer of oil in a pan, and you're more like pan frying it versus, or shallow frying it versus deep frying it, that's another reason why you might not have the result you're looking for. If you hear it starting to bubble and sizzle now, it's because the inside is, is cooking through and some of that moisture from the, uh, the pork as it's cooking is coming out. Let's see what we have here. And in my opinion, I'm seeing something that looks a lot more along the lines of what I would expect to see when I get one from the Chinese restaurant. And I believe a large part of it is because I am fully frying this submerged. Now, one thing to remember is when you're gonna, when you're frying these, um, when you are done with that first batch, when you're coming in for the next batch, you should check the temperature of your oil and make sure that it's back up at 350. And I'm gonna start to heat up this pan here while we're talking. So we're looking at 330, which is good. And you see in here, take a look inside there. See some of that stuff? We wanna always be skimming. So we're gonna do a quick skim to get that. Um, that's the cornstarch that's in there. But you see, the other thing about cornstarch is, notice how it didn't brown. And if you had used flour, besides the fact that you might've made glue, all them stuck together because of the moisture, the flour would have gotten in here and it would have browned. If you think about when you make fried chicken, homemade fried chicken, right? Um, that, that flour gets in here and it starts to brown and it really dirties up your oil, okay? So we'll do another round real quick here. One, two. And how do you know when you need to change your oil? You'll know when it's time to change the oil because, hang on. By the way, one thing is I'm gonna, I'm adding these kind of fast because I, the first batch I could tell but when I start to see it sizzle quickly like this, I slow down a little bit because I wanna make sure that nothing, that there's not a bunch of water that might come out. Because if water comes out here, it'll foam like that and you don't want it to overflow out of the pan. Um, you'll know when it's time to change the oil when the, the product, either the oil gets really dirty looking, like with, with you were doing like flour product in there, or you start to notice that the, the product is getting really greasy. And so when you look at this, right, we did, I did put it on a paper towel, but see how they don't look all shiny, greasy, right? They look nice and crisp. And that's because the oil is fresh and clean. And then you also got to look at smell. If the oil is dirty, it will start to smell like burnt. It won't smell very good. 
So that's another indicator. So we'll let these fry. Let me check the temperature over time. And see, it's, it's frying evenly, but it's not screaming. It's not, it's not furiously bubbling. It's just carefully doing its thing. And the goal is to get it to fry throughout, get golden crisp, on, golden color on the outside and golden crisp throughout. And that's that timing game that we're, it's, we're all we're working with, right? The, the, the time and temperature to make sure it cooks throughout, crisps up the wonton without burning it on the outside. It's kind of like when you cook your turkey or chicken, right? If you have the temperature too high, then what'll happen is it, um, that skin gets really brown and then you're like, oh my God, it's raw on the inside and, and having to work through that, okay? Now we're gonna do edamame. So here I have, uh, we have our, these are salted edamame. So these are cooked already and they're salted, they're seasoned already and I've defrosted them. And this is a, our Maikai brand. We have this and we have a black pepper one and a wasabi one, which is really, really cool. I'm just gonna open this. I have a, I have a wok pan here. I'm gonna turn the light on, to maybe be easier. Um, I, it's lightly seasoned and I'm gonna put some oil in there. And we wanna get this smoking, okay? The goal, see it's starting to ripple, right? Now I'm gonna turn um, the fan on just so that, because it's gonna smoke a little bit. Keeping an eye on our wonton here. We wanna get this smoking because I wanna put it in here. I'm gonna coat the edamame, and I want them to lightly char, which means I'm gonna leave them in the pan so that little pieces of them actually burn. And that's what's gonna do is gonna give you a nice kind of a smoky flavor that adds to this whole uh, mix of things that's going on. So the edamame was frozen, right? Yeah, it was frozen. I defrosted them. Oh, okay. Yeah, so when I brought them home today, um, I just let them sit in the. I just let them sit in the refrigerator so they naturally get frosted. Okay, see now I'm smoking here, right? This is gonna go in. And again, I'm not gonna just. I'm not gonna put them in and just automatically start tossing them. I want them to start to brown a little bit or caramelize or char on the bottom before um, I toss them, okay? Here we go. You see that charring? That's what I'm looking for, okay? And why are you looking for the charring? Why is that so important? The smoky flavor it's gonna give. So when you when you bite these, right? A lot of this whole thing is when you eat them, hang on, let's see what we got here. Again, look at that golden, deep golden color. That's really what's gonna help uh, ensure that these are, these will stay crispy. You want to get all the moisture out of the wrapper when you fry them. Okay. okay, so when you think about eating edamame, right? Half the best part of the edamame, right, is when you take the pod and you put it in your mouth and you suck on it and then you pull it, right? And so really it's all that seasoning that's on the outside. And when you char this, it's going to give you that smoky flavor. It gives it a nice smoky richness that so adds depth to the flavor of this. But you don't want the whole thing to be black. You just want a little couple pieces here and there to be black. So you get every so often, you get a little, 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 little hit of that smoky flavor, which is really delicious. So we're just gonna let that cook. I'm gonna, the next thing that's gonna go in here is shortly, right? I remember there's two things that I'm doing here. I just moved it around because I wanted to space them out a little bit, but I am using defrosted edamame 
and I'm basically heating them through because they're already cooked. So I'm not really having to cook them. I'm just trying to char them and get the flavoring on the outside and I'm good. Now, if you were in a rush and you're on the fly, you could defrost them in the microwave or you could throw them in frozen. And basically what you're gonna do is do the same process. You might have to throw a little bit of water in and let it evaporate because it'll create steam and it'll help it defrost quickly. Okay, so these are looking really good. The next thing I wanna do is I'm gonna throw my garlic in. I did not throw the garlic in the beginning because it would have burned by now. So I only want the garlic flavor and the fra fragrance in here. So I want the garlic to cook through and season this without burning. But at this point, I really now, I'm not trying to char anymore, but get all these flavors to infuse, okay? So we've got a, a the shoyu is gonna go down. The shoyu basically is deglazing. So you hear it sizzle, it's gonna give you some flavor. You smell it in here, it smells really good. I'm gonna add a little bit of, this is Hawaiian salt, alae. And that's it's red because of the clay soil that they add to the salt, which gives it a nice flavor. And then I'm gonna add some chili flakes. Now, if you don't want it to be spicy, you don't need to add this. If you want it to be more spicy, you can add more. And then I'm gonna add some sesame oil. And again, this is a flavoring oil. So I don't wanna cook with it. I'm just adding it at the end. And I'm gonna throw some sesame seeds for fun. Toss it. We'll go ahead and put in a bowl here. And then I'm gonna garnish it with just a little bit more chili flakes. Now these are really great eaten fresh like this, but if you want them to marinate and get more flavor, you could do this, put them in the refrigerator. Let's come on this side and we'll look at this real quick. Uh, put them in the fridge and then um, serve them later. Now, just fun too, and color and flavor. We'll throw some green onions on here. So do you eat them cold or hot? You, you can eat them cold or hot. I think they taste great hot like this, um, but you can eat them cold or room temperature. Um, they're, they're, they're great both ways. Okay, so now we've got this done. Uh, I am gonna, I have the wontons or the, the uh, these are done. So since we have some time, uh, we're gonna have some fun and we're gonna do, uh, I figured what the heck, we'll do some uh, gon lo men or, or chow men basically, okay? And this is another one of those dishes I think that you can make very easily and very simply for your get togethers. And you should, it's one of those things that you should, I think you should have in your repertoire. So back to the walk over here. Question about the crispy gauji. Yes. How do you know the pork inside is cooked? Like, do you need to take the temperature of the the inside. Yeah, I mean, you want to, you can poke one with a thermometer and you can te test it for like 165. I know they're done because they've been there for like, they're really in there for like eight minutes and they're really golden brown. And like we talked about when, when the pork is already cooked, it starts to push out moisture and some of it was coming out. Do you remember that first grass it was starting to sizzle and bubble a lot after it had been quiet all the time. So it tells me that it's pushing that out. The other way that, you know, we do all the time is, um, the old school method, which is you break one open and then you must eat it, right? So those are the couple ways you can check. So again, I'm gonna put some oil in here. Wanna get it nice and hot. And by the way, part of the what helps too is I've seasoned this pan. It was it was a nonstick, but over time the stick, the nonstick has come up a little bit, but I heat it up hot and I get the oil in and it starts to smoke and it also seals in the, uh, the steel. To, it helps it help make it less, um, I'm gonna make it more nonstick, okay? So now I'm gonna add my onions. And I, 
one of the things that's in this a lot is cabbage. I didn't have cabbage, but again, I'm not gonna let that stop me, right, from doing this. I'm adding my onions, and on this one, what makes, in my opinion, gono min really good is that charring again. So I wanna, I wanna get this in here, and I'm gonna let it cook so I can get some charring going on these onions. And I have this at full blast right now. Let me get some the oyster sauce. See how it's starting to char up, which is that's what I'm looking for. It's one of those instances where it's a good thing to burn your food, okay? So if this is something you're good at, burning your food, then you should definitely put this in your repertoire. And these are noodles, these are, um, these are chow mein noodles. Uh, there are thicker noodles. These are dry noodles. This is from Crown Noodle locally here. Um, I like Crown Noodles. Their product is, this is to me, the closest that you get when you go to, in my opinion, Chinese restaurants, um, Gon Lo Min. And in Hawaii here, Gon Lo Min is a dry noodle. Um, and it's not, it's not saucy and it's not like chow mein where the kind that I've, that he said I've had when I've been, lived in the mainland where it's very saucy or it's also called lo mein, right? I've seen it called lo mein. This is a different kind of a style of noodle. And we do have a recipe for this on foodland.com. I'm pretty sure I made this with Cheryl too. Okay. So now we're gonna go ahead and add, this is char siu and bean sprouts. I'm gonna toss that. I wanna get all the flavor together. And let it do its thing. I'm gonna add just a little bit more, just a little bit more fat because it's sounding like it's dry. A little bit more. You see how it came back to life suddenly when I added that in there? You know, here's the thing that you want, like when you're doing it. One of the things I learned a lot about doing stir fries and wok cooking is you don't put everything in the pot and cook it all in one shot. Lots of times it's a couple stages, okay? Now I probably did a little bit differently in the video, but what I'm gonna do here is because I'm looking at this pan and I'm going, you know what, if I add noodles in that, it's gonna be too much. So I'm gonna take this, which is now looking good and it's coming together, put it on the side. Then I can start with my noodles again. A little more fat. Coat the pan. Add my noodles. And even for this, it's a little bit, it's a little much. I'm not gonna be able to put all of it. I don't wanna overcrowd the pan. That's the thing about cooking too, right? Uh, when you're learning how to cook or you're cooking at home, they're like, ah, just a little bit, let's throw the rest in and then you overcrowd the pan and then you're steaming stuff and it's not really working out. And you're wondering, oh, how come it's not that good? It's because you make these split second decisions for, for ease or because you don't wanna have to do another batch. And the, 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 the result of that is you're, you end up without a dish that tastes quite as good as it would have if you hadn't done that. And these noodles kind of like to stick. So I'm getting a little sticking here, right there. But again, this is a dry noodle. So I'm trying to warm these through. They're fully cooked. But you see right there, I'm, gonna, I'm trying to get a little bit more of that crisping again in this noodle because it's gonna add texture and flavor. Okay, so now I'm gonna go ahead and add this back in. I'm gonna add some oyster sauce. Show you. Sesame oil. Sesame seeds. I'm gonna bring this all together.
keep in mind, like I'm not, don't feel afraid if you have to use utensils or tongs in here to move this around because in this instance, even this pan, this wok is a little bit small and I, I'm not able to completely toss it the way I want to, but I want to incorporate all the flavors together. That's important. I want all, these, all of the flavors to come together. I want to coat it nicely. With that thing, it looks good. And then we'll go ahead and plate it. Here, I'll do it. I'm going to do it back. Now, if you like cilantro, or what's also known as Chinese parsley, perfect dish for that. Um, I know there are people that love it, and then other people that hate it. So you got to make your call on which one, which one you either you are or your guests are, and make a decision on that. I'm gonna add a little bit more sesame seeds. What about green onion? Glad you asked that question. Come on this side. So green onions. So we have that. So here we have, and I'm gonna just cut some of this up because you know, what, what kind of a sort of Chinese, uh, local style Chinese get together wouldn't be good without some char siu. And if you had some pork hash, right? So I'll put some of this here, cut this up. And if someone is making this dish with tofu, would mm -hmm. you recommend they fry the tofu before? Yeah, the, and making sure you're using firm tofu because all this action might break it up, yeah. Um, to that point, if you want to do a version here now, this these this particular type of noodle has egg in it. But if you wanted to do a kind of a vegetarian style, you don't have to put the char siu, but you could do shiitake mushrooms would work really good with that. Um, probably some of the other alternative seitan things like that could work. Um, you could also do it with seafood, like dry scallop would probably be really interesting, or dried shrimp. So there's a lot of different ways you can go with it. But you know, here's a real quick sort of a real quick put together that we have. And of course, would not be complete without some mustard. But this is a real quick, uh, like what you might see, you know, at a get together, at um, the beginnings of a get together. And, you know, to that point, in normal times, I think it wouldn't be, it would not be unreasonable to go to someone's house for Thanksgiving and have your turkey and stuffing and this at the table at the same time. So, you know, what's missing maybe is some spicy ahi poke, some, so maki sushi, you know, futomaki would be really good with this, but I'm getting really hungry just looking at this. Um, so here we have, we do have our wok chart at Abame. We've got our crispy gauji, a little extra credit. Uh, gono man, or you could call this uh, chow man. Uh, are there any last questions before we kind of wrap this thing up? No questions. Everyone no questions. says it, it looks great and everyone is hungry. <laughs> awesome. Well. Uh, we're going to see you in two weeks, uh, Wednesday, which the date will be, I guess it's 14, yeah, 16, 14 plus two. Um, uh, I think we'll keep on the theme. You know, I think it's nice to do things that are, you know, perfect for the season. Um, we'll have more fun with that. And uh, for those of you that do do this recipe, let me know how it works out. If you do it the way I said, use it the deep fry method, don't shallow fry, fry the right temperature, fry it all the way crisp throughout. And let's see how, how crispy these hold up. And by the way, I forgot, I forgot. So this is mustard, right? So I'm using Coleman's English dry mustard and I rehydrate it with water. And then I add a show you to that. So perfect for the, the Chinese food. Also perfect for sashimi if you don't have wasabi. And with that, we'll see you guys in about two weeks. And we hope you guys all had a great weekend. And bye now. <laughs>